In the last section of the book, we looked at vector fields. And two primary examples of vector fields are force fields and velocity fields. Mathematically, they're both the same. It's you define a vector at each point in a region in the plane or space or whatever dimension you want. Um, in this section, we're going to talk about line integrals. And it, probably the best example to keep in mind for this is a force field. And there's a mathematical definition of a line integral. But um, our, the only application we're going to look uh, at in this section is to calculating the work done on an object that's moving through a force field. Um, we looked at force and the work done by force way back in chapter one, but then the force was constant. So I want to remind you what we did there so that we can chop things up into little pieces and get an integral. And then I just want to do two fairly long examples, or make a definition and then do two fairly long examples of line integrals. So if you recall, way back in chapter one, we had a force. So this is force. It's a force vector. Right now I'm thinking of it as a vector in R3, so in space. But assume it's constant. So, so you can think a constant force field, but it's constant. What we saw then was that if you had, if d, a vector d, is the displacement vector of an object, So imagine the, the vector, the arrow that goes from where the object starts to where it ends, the displacement vector, then the dot product naturally gives you the work done by the force on the object during that displacement. We usually just say the work done by the force suppress the on the object. But the work done by the force. Um, it's uh, you know, work done is kind of energy put in. So given to the object. And if it's negative, it's kind of like you took energy away. Um, all right. So, yeah, that was with constant forces. So what do we do when we have a force field? Well, you've had enough calculus that you ought to know, and I'm going to draw a picture in R2 just because it's a lot easier for me. But if you have a force field, so now a force field in R2, so that the force changes from point to point, I'm just drawing more or less random vectors, although I do want things to be continuous, so I should uh, have them coming back around to being the same vector as I get close to here. So maybe I'll draw this one a little more like that. If you've got a vector field, then and you have an object, so a force field, think force field right now, force field. And you have an object moving along a curve, this force field. So I'm going to get out some different. So you move along some parameterized curve. And this means you need to recall, I'll call that curve C, and I'm trying to put little arrows on it to indicate we're going from here to here. You need to recall also from chapter one that we had oriented piecewise regular curves. Piecewise regular just means they can be parameterized nicely, at least Maybe you have to pick a finite number of different parameterizations. That's the piecewise. And oriented means we've picked a direction as the positive direction. It's determined by the um, direction of the tangent vectors. 
But so I'm indicating arrows to say, oh, we're going from here to here. So the question is, how much work? is done by F on an object. Moving along C, which moves along C. And of course, you use an integral. You chop up the curve into lots of little pieces over which the force is essentially constant. And then, and then you take you know, an approximate displacement vector. So you take the displacement vector between two nearby points on the curve. You take the dot product like you would to get the work if the force were constant. Then you add up all those infinitesimal little contributions of work to get the total work. So let me draw a zoomed in picture on the curve. So here's some curve C. And what you do is you just take, take two points on C that I would like to say are very close together, but if I draw them too close, you won't be able to see that they're different points. So, and I want to take this small displacement vector and you know, take a small displacement vector from here to here and a small displacement vector from here to here. Um, and you know, chop up the curve, pick points along the curve, chop it up little pieces and approximate the curve by the, the series of displacement vectors, and then estimate the work done on each piece by dotting F with the right thing, and then taking the limit as the size of the pieces gets smaller and smaller and you have more and more of them. Um, and what do you get? Well, infinitesimally, if you're happy working infinitesimally, you get the force field evaluated at each point times an infinitesimal change in well, x, y, and z. So I'm going to write r for the radial vector. That's why it's r, the vector x, y. Uh, I'm just in two dimensions, the vector x, y. If I were in three dimensions, it would be x, y, and z. If I was in more dimensions, I'd use x1, x2, x3 out through xn. So that the vector dr, an infinitesimal change in r, is an infinitesimal change in x, comma, an infinitesimal change in y. And this dot product. The dot product of this small change in the radial vector, so think you take the vector infinitesimal change in x, infinitesimal change in y. This would give us the work if the force were constant and we were just going from one of these places to the other. But, so this is an infinitesimal amount of work. It's the dot product. That's a vector quantity, a vector quantity. The dot product is a scalar quantity. This is a little infinitesimal chunk of work. And you add all of those together continuously. So you do, you calculate an integral. Um, as you move along the curve C, you actually, to calculate that, you need to pick parameterizations of the curve. So let's go ahead and make the definition. Ah, something I should say. We're doing line integrals along curves. <laughs> that terminology should seem a little bad to you. Um, it's classic, it's probably not going to change. Even though you always, you rarely do this along lines, or I don't know, sometimes you do it along lines. We're gonna do some examples with line segments. But usually you want this along curves. Nonetheless, it's rarely called a curve integral. It's always called a line integral. Uh, I didn't make up the terminology. It is classic, it's not going to change anytime soon. So, um, we of course want the integral to exist. It will exist. It will exist if we assume F is a continuous force field. So, definition. Suppose that 
F is a continuous vector field. And I'm thinking of a force field, but it doesn't have to be force. On and let's go with an open subset of Rn. And suppose C is an oriented piecewise regular. And we will see examples of this. If you've forgotten what oriented piecewise regular means, we're going to look at examples piecewise regular. Piecewise regular uh, curve in U, then, oh, then the line integral of F along C is, well, you write an integral sign, you indicate the, your oriented piecewise regular curve, and then it's, you add up all these little f dot drs, um, right? It's really, it's a limit of Riemann sums as you chop up your curve into smaller and smaller pieces. And how do you calculate it? If you have a parameterization of your curve C, it means you take, your, you take your vector field, you evaluate it, you evaluate it at the points your parameterizations passes through, so the points on C, so I'm going to write that R of T is a parameterization of C, um, dotted with, well, dr, but if, I'll write it up here, r equals r of T, the T between A and B, is a parameterization of C, then dr is r prime of t dt. And that's how you calculate this. So the dr becomes r prime of t dt. So this is what you do to calculate line integrals along curves. You parameterize your curve, possibly in pieces. Um, you parameterize your curve. You, you look at your vector field at points given by the parameterization. You dot with r prime of t dt and you evaluate from a to b. It's, um, it kind of follows from the definition of chopping up the curve without reference to the parameterization. But this is independent of the parameterization as long as it's piecewise regular and the orientation goes the right way. So it doesn't matter which parameterization you pick. C itself can matter, but what parameterization you pick of C, as long as it goes in the right direction, doesn't matter. And we'll see an example of that. So um, this is the line integral. And yeah, the big deal, if F is a force field and, X and the variables like X, Y, and Z, or X and Y, are measuring position, then Yes, this is the work done by that force field on an object um, as the object moves along the curve C. So I want to look at kind of two extended examples of this. They will take a while. Um, before we do that, I want to mention some notation for how you negate curves, how you kind of stick two curves oriented, piecewise oriented curves together and how you sometimes see line integrals written that looks different from this. But then we'll do two examples. So a little more notation first. So, yeah, so you've got this line integral. 
Well, suppose your vector field is given to you with component functions. So maybe you could do this with two or three variables. Those are our most important cases. So maybe your component functions are called P, Q, and R. We'll call them something. Then the radial vector here, R, would be x, y, z. And dr, dr then, of course, is dx, comma, dy, comma, dz. And so what you could write for this dot product is, well, the dot product of this with this. So you multiply corresponding things together and you add. So sometimes you'll see line integral, instead of having this dot product notation, sometimes you'll see it in this notation. Don't let that worry you. I mean, you should understand it's the same thing. Then there's nice notation to use when you're talking about curves. So if I've got one oriented curve, like here's a C1, and I want to pick up where C1 leaves off and go to another point. You know, here's some curve C2 that starts at this point, goes to this point. Then we'd like to have a name for the combined, so this is piecewise regular because, yeah, we might have to parameterize it using one parameterization here and another one here, but that's fine. It's piecewise regular. It's a finite number of those jammed together. So if you call this whole curve C, this whole oriented curve that goes from here to here to here, we would usually denote that C is C1 plus. We use an addition symbol to say that we've stuck those two oriented curves together. Of course, notice this one needs to start where that one ends up so that you get this one piece. This is technically called the concatenation. The concatenation of C1 and C2. And we could add more. You know, we could put a plus C3 and have C3 coming along here. You know, C1 plus C2 plus C3. Understand that even though we're using a plus symbol and you think normal addition is commutative so that C1 plus C2 is the same as C2 plus C1, we mean that you take these in order. So C2, in this picture, for instance, C2 plus C1 wouldn't even be defined because you need for the first curve to end where the second curve starts. You just need to be careful with this summation sign. It's not like we're doing algebra. We're just indicating we stuck two curves together in that order, first C1, then C2. Um, there's also negation. So since we have oriented curves, we could talk about, oh, reversing the orientation. And we use a negative sign to denote that. So if this were C1, then what would negative C1 be? Well, it would be the same curve, except the orientation goes the other way. So negative C1. Um, OK. So, but you have to be a little careful. Remember, if I had a, a C2 going here, so I had a, C, a C1 going this way, C1 going that way, C2 going that way. And yeah, negative means reverse the orientation. So my question is, what is negative C1 plus C2? Well, C1 plus C2 is this whole oriented curve. So negative C1 plus C2 would be the curve that starts over here and goes in the opposite direction. But that means you start with negative C2 and then do negative C1. So it's important to keep the order straight. You get negative C2 and then minus C1, right? If you negate this, first you do this thing that's negative C2. Then you pick up this one that's negative C1. Um, one last thing, I mean, like I've written here, subtraction means to add the negation. When we write something like this, it means adding the negation. All right, with that notation out of the way, um, let's finally, let's do some, a couple of examples. So, suppose you've got a force field. And 
there's a particular one I want, I'm going to have it in the xy plane. So, example. Let f equal x minus y squared, comma minus x squared. This is a force field, so this is in newtons. We'll assume x and y are in meters. I want to look at I want to look at the curve, the piecewise oriented piecewise regular curve that starts at zero zero, goes to two minus two, so two minus two, so here's two minus two along a straight line. So we're going to go here, and then I want to go along a straight line from 2 minus 2 to 0 minus 2, and then I want to go up the straight line back to 0, 0, so to make a closed, a closed curve. So we're going here, here, and then back up there around this closed curve. I don't want to try to sketch the whole vector field because um, <laughs> it would take a long time. Um, it's certainly in the book, but let me kind of indicate something that will be relevant to us later, which is that the vector field starts out, at least give you some idea of what it does along the curve. It kind of starts out like this and starts turning a little as you move down, more than that. And I have to draw these arrows bigger than they should be so that you can see them more easily. And then, as you move along here, they kind of flatten out. And by the time you get over to this edge, Certainly over here, they're all perpendicular to the y-axis. That you can see easily, because when x is 0, when x is 0, you get a 0 there. So you get no y-component to the vector. So the vectors are definitely horizontal. But they're minus, minus y squared. Um, so they should be decreasing in length as you get closer to zero, but they're always perpendicular and have a negative x component. All right. Great. So, what, what could you see immediately just from knowing the vector field along the curve? So, oh, what's the question? Find the work done. So, find the work done by the vector field. along A, C1, B, C2, C along C3, and D along the entire curve. curve C equals first C1, then C2, then C3. All right, well, first I want to say that just from the vector field, you can see that just from this, my bad picture of the vector field, you can see that the line integral will be positive. In fact, it'll be positive along each piece. Oh, I didn't label anything. This is C1, this is C2, We'll call this piece over here C3. Even from my bad picture of the vector field, you can see that every piece of this line integral will be positive because the dot product itself is positive before you add them up. And that's because the dot product, we're going to, along each part of the curve, we're going to calculate something that looks like the vector field evaluated at the point times 
r prime of t, which is a vector tangent to the curve. So those dot products, you look at the tangent, well, this is a line, so tangent is just the line itself, a tangent vector, or it's a vector parallel to the line. That dot product is always positive because the angle is less than or equal to 90 degrees, so that um, each dot product is positive, so that the summation of them will be positive. Same thing along here, the angle is always less than 90 degrees, and here the dot product is going to be zero, so I shouldn't have said along each piece will be positive. Along here, the dot products of the vector field dotted with r prime of t, um, those dot products will all be zero. So I shouldn't have said they're all positive. They're positive along here, positive along here, zero along here. And when we add them all up in part d, we should get something positive. How do you do this? You have to parameterize the three pieces separately. So I want to do that. In fact, I'll parameterize c1 two different ways so you can see that, in fact, what you get is somewhat surprisingly independent of the parameterization. I, mean, I said it was true, but it still may surprise you. So let's do this. All right, so in part A, we need to parameterize the line segment that starts at 0, 0, and goes to 2 minus 2. Well, the easiest parameterization, one that we looked at a long time ago, if you want to start at 0, 0, and go to 2, 2, the easy parameterization, uh, sorry, 2 minus 2, is to take your starting point plus t times your final point minus your starting point, and let t be, go from 0 to 1. When t is 0, you're at 0, 0. When t is 1, then you get 1 times that. The 0, 0 is cancel. I mean, there's 0, 0, so you need them in the first place. But you get 2 minus 2. So this is kind of the, the most straightforward parameterization that has you at your initial point at time 0 and your final point at time 1. This, of course, simplifies. I was writing what you do for any pair of points. But this simplifies to... 2t minus 2t. All right. And our vector field, I'll, I'll write it again so it's conveniently right here. All right. We want, so this is our parameterization of C1. Parameterize is C1. And so we want to calculate the line integral of f along c1. That means we will let t go from 0 to 1. We take f of r of t dotted with r prime of t dt. So we'll integrate from 0 to 1 f of r of t. It means Every place you see an x, you put in what's in the x-coordinate here, 2t. Every place you see a y, you put in what's in the y-coordinate here, minus 2t. So, <clears throat> so you take 2t, it goes there. 2t minus y squared, so minus 4t squared, comma. Um, this minus x squared, but with x replaced by 2t, so minus 4t squared. You dot with, I'm going to have to dot down here, with r prime of t. So that's just 2 minus 2. And you integrate with respect to t. So what we're getting is the integral from 0 to 1 of 4t minus 8t squared plus 8t squared. The 8t squareds cancel. We, we integrate 4t. You get 2t squared evaluated from 0 to 1. You get 2. Units, joules. Force units times distance units. So you get 
two joules for the line integral along C1. All right, I would like to calculate that same line integral. I still want line integral along C1, but I'd like to take a parameterization that goes at half the speed. So it takes it twice as long to get from zero to one, just to verify that we get the same thing. So let me keep my curve here. So let's calculate another way. We're still doing part A. We're still calculating line integral of f along c1. But now let's take a different parameterization. Let's use r of t equals t minus t. So skip the twos, but now for t between 0 and 2. All right, so when, when t is 0, you're at 0, 0. When t is 2, you're at 2 minus 2, but you have to go to time 2 so to get as far. So this one goes at half the speed of our other parameterization, if you're thinking of this describing a moving particle. And still, it's not going to affect the value of the line integral. It better not. So you integrate from 0 to 2. You take f with x replaced by t and y replaced by minus t. So x is replaced by t. So you get t. y is replaced by minus t. Quantity squared, though. So you just get t squared minus t squared dotted with r prime of t. That's 1 minus 1 dt. And you integrate, you get the integral from 0 to 2, you get t minus t squared plus t squared dt, the t squareds cancel, and you get just the integral of t dt, that's t squared over 2, evaluated from 0 to 2, you plug in 2, you get 2 squared over 2, that's 2 minus 0, you get 2 joules again. So, and as long as your parameterization takes you along the curve in the same direction, doesn't matter which one you pick, you're going to get the same value for the line integral. All right, so along C1, let's record this somewhere. A, the work along C1 is 2 joules. All right, let's find the work done by F along C2. Well, you keep doing the same kinds of things. You change your parameterization, but you calculate essentially the same way. So you can pick any parameterization from here to here, but we'll go with kind of the standard where you take your initial point, 2 minus 2, and you take plus t times your final point, which is 0 minus 2, minus 2 minus 2. And this is for t between 0 and 1. Right? It's always the standard parameterization for a line segment, a directed, an oriented line segment that goes from this point to the other point. At time 0, this puts you at 2 minus 2. At time 1, the 2 minus 2's cancel and you're at 0 minus 2. So that um, uh, if you simplify this, or if you isolate what we're using for x and y, in the, let me, so this is 2 minus 2. Here, this is plus t times, you get a minus 2, 0. Right? If you simplify this, you get minus 2 for x and minus 2 minus minus 2, so minus 2, 0. So you use r of t equals, this is 2 minus 2t two in the x-coordinate and then t times 0, 0, so just minus 2 in the y-coordinate. Yeah. No surprise, your y-coordinate is constantly minus 2. When t is 0, you're at x is 2. When t is 1, you're at x is 0. Good. And so using this parameterization, what do we calculate for the line integral of f along c2? Well, we find you integrate from 0 to 1. Every place we see an x in the vector field, we replace it by 2 minus 2t. Every place we see a y, we replace it by the constant, minus 2. So here's the vector field. You replace x by 2 minus 2t. 
you replace y by minus 2, so you subtract minus 2 quantity squared, so you get a minus 4, um, comma minus x squared, so minus 2 minus 2t squared. This is dotted with, this is dotted with r prime of t, you get minus 2, 0. So actually, let me, give, let me rewrite this smaller so I can fit everything. Right here, we had 2 minus 2t minus 4, comma, comma, minus, um, minus 2 minus 2t quantity squared. I, I was put this in for x, put in minus 2 for y, put that in for x, dotted with the derivative of this, but this is minus 2, 0. And then you integrate with respect to t. What's so nice here, or part of what's so nice here, is that you get a 0 here, and 0 dotted with this wipes this part out, so we don't get anything from that part. We get the integral from 0 to 1 of just minus 2 times this. This is minus 2t minus 2. So we get a minus 2 times minus 2t minus 2 dt. We can factor a minus 2 out of there times that minus 2. We get 4 times the integral from 0 to 1. All right, I pulled out that minus 4. I pulled out a minus 2 from there. So we get t plus 1 dt. And so what we calculate along c2 The work done by the vector, by the force field, is we get 4 times, you get t squared over 2 plus t evaluated from 0 to 1. So we get 4 times a half plus 1, and that is 2 plus 4, we get 6 joules. So that's what we calculate for the work done along C2, 6 joules. Now we need to calculate the work done along C3. Now we know from the picture that this is going to be zero. In fact, all of the individual dot products are zero. But let's just write it carefully. So we've got, just so you can see that the picture is not lying, our vector field hasn't changed. Our vector field is x minus y squared minus x squared. We want to parameterize the, the oriented curve C3. So we start at 0 minus 2. And we want to end at 0, 0. So this is our standard parameterization. Again, this is for t between 0 and 1. We get 0 minus 2 plus t times. You get zeros, you get minus minus 2, so you get 0, 2. And so we get 0 in the x coordinate and minus 2 plus 2t two in the y coordinate. So when t is 0, yes, we're at 0 minus 2, and when t is 1, we're at 0, 0. All right? And then what do you do? Well, to calculate the line integral along C3, on F dotted with dr. This is the integral from 0 to 1 of F of r of t dotted with r prime of t dt. F of r of t, you put in 0 for x and minus 2 plus 2t for y every place. So, you put in 0 for x, and in the y you put in minus, minus 2, minus 2, uh, plus 2t squared, and then comma, the minus x squared, so that's 0, and then you dot with r prime of t. r prime of t is 0, 2, dt. And yeah, you see that these individual dot products are all zero because zero times this is zero and zero times that is zero. 
So your integrand is zero, so yes, this integral, as we knew it would be, gives us zero joules. So that's the work done by the vector field along C3. What's the work done well, if you go along C1, then along C2, then along C3? The sum of these. So um, the nice thing, which I should have said when I was using the summation notation for concatenation of curves, is for part D, the line integral along the whole curve, which is the line integral along C1 plus C2 plus C3 of F. Well, of course, you just add together the individual pieces of work. So that's one of the nice things about the summation notation. If you're integrating over the sum of the curves, it splits up into the sum of the integrals. And if you negate the curve, it negates the integral because all you did was change the orientation, so you're going in the opposite direction. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this is, this splits up the line integral as a, as a sum. And so we just add our three results to plus 6, plus 0, so that's 8 joules. It'll be important to us in the next section that we had a closed curve here, and the line integral around this closed curve is not 0. That tells us something important about the vector field. It's not some really special kind of vector field that we'll talk about. It's not a conservative vector field. Um, it also means that <coughs> this example shows us that while the parameterization of the curve doesn't matter, I mean, we move, change one of the parameterizations, the actual curve itself does. It's not just the, the endpoints that matters. For instance, in this example, you know, C1 is a curve from 0, 0 to 2 minus 2. What's another curve from 0, 0 to 2 minus 2? Well, one of them is we could negate C3 and go this way. So negative C3 is the same curve except with the reverse orientation. Negative C2 is that curve but with the reversed orientation. So that one. So what is another curve that starts at zero, so P, an oriented piecewise regular curve that starts at 0, 0 and goes 2 minus 2? Well first we go from here to here and then from there to there. So that would be minus C3, minus C2. That's another curve that goes from there to there. What's my point? My point is that those two curves give you different line integrals. Why? We already figured out the line integral along C1. It's two joules. So we already decided, we already calculated the line integral of F along C1 is 2 joules. My claim is that without essentially any more work, we know the line integral of F along minus C3 minus C2. Um, and what is it? It's, well, this is um, the line integral along negative C3, and then you add to that line and go along negative C2, but negating that orientation, so reversing the direction, just negates the integrals. This is negative the line integral along C3 of f dot dr, and this is minus the line integral along C2 of f dot dr, but these we already calculated. That line integral was zero, so we get zero this is 0, and this one, this one, the line integral along C2 was 6, so we get minus 6. Joules. So here are two paths that both start at 0, 0 and go to 2 minus 2. One that goes here and then here, and one that just goes straight there. Along one of those paths, the line integral is 2 joules, 
And along the other path, the line integral is minus 6 joules. The point being that, yes, for a given path, different parameterizations, as long as they go in the same direction, give you the same line integral. But different paths between the same starting and, and ending points can give you very different integrals. Again, um, as we'll see in the next section, for something called conservative vector fields, you can pick any path you want between two points and you'll get the same line integral either way, but that's very special. Most well, a lot of vector fields are not conservative. All right, I do want to look at an example in C3. Uh, C3, in R3. So, this is a new example. I just want to do one of them in three dimensions. Example. Let's look at, let's consider the vector field F equals YZ plus E to the X, XZ plus cosine of Y, and xy plus 1 over 1 plus z squared. There's a vector field on R3. I'm not going to phrase this in terms of work. I'm just going to calculate the line integral. And what I'd like to do is calculate two different line integrals um, between the same points. So I want to start at 1, 0, 0. Um, go into the origin, call that oriented curve, call that C1, then go up to 0, 0, 1 along the z-axis, um, call that C2, and then I would like to, instead of doing that, in the xz plane, Take a semicircle, that's supposed to be a semicircle in the xz plane, or a quarter of a circle. It's supposed to be part of a circle in the xz plane, call it C3. And what I would like to do is compare the line integrals. I'd like to calculate the line integral of F along C1 plus C2. So the line integral as you go here, here, and there and compare it with the line integral along C3. What we're going to see is that they're the same. Now this doesn't prove that for any two points in space and any two paths between them that you'd get the same line integral as long as the starting and ending points are the same, but that is true for this vector field. As I keep saying, we're going to look at this in the next section. Some vector fields are very special. That's one of them. It's a conservative vector field and it's going to tell us Part of what that tells us is that the line integrals along these paths better be the same because they start and end at the same place. But let's see what we get. So let's make sure we get what I say we should get. All right. Ah, yes, I meant to, well, I was going to say I meant to write more clearly that that was part of a circle, C3, but we'll do it in a second. So, all right, we need to parameterize C1. Well, this is actually getting a little old. We, we parameterize by our standard parameterization from one point to another. We start at 1, 0, 0, and you take t plus, uh, plus t times where you end up minus where you started. And, but all of that's a complicated way of saying in this easy case that we get 1 minus t, 0, 0. So yeah, you're moving along the x-axis, so y and z are 0 when t, oh, sorry, for, as always. 
not as always, but for these straight line parameterizations. When t is 0, you start at 1, 0, 0, and when t is 1, you're at the origin. Great. I will not rewrite our vector field every time, but I need to calculate the line integral of our vector field along this curve. So that means I integrate as t goes from 0 to 1. I take my vector field. Um, it helps that, that y and z are both 0, um, and x is 1 minus t. So our vector field becomes e to the 1 minus t. Um, x and z, is it cosine of y? Uh, yes. Just wanted to make sure I wrote the right vector field. So suddenly cosine of y didn't look like what I wanted. All right. Uh, we plug this in. We get 0. And the cosine of 0 is 1. And then y is 0, and we get, and z is 0. So here we get 1. So this is our vector field evaluated at R of t. I'm not rewriting the vector field, so you have to verify that. Um, and then you dot with r prime of t. r prime of t is minus 1, 0, 0. So it really didn't matter what we got here and here, because we've got zeros there. We just get the integral from 0 to 1 of minus e to the 1 minus t dt. This integrates to just e to the 1 minus t. And then you evaluate as t goes from 0 to 1. So we get e to the 0, e to the 0 minus e to the 1. So we get 1 minus e. So that's what we're getting for the line integral along c1, 1 minus e. So I'm just going to write, I'm going to write a very brief, the integral along 1 minus c is 1 minus e. All right. OK. What's the line integral along C2? Well, we have to parameterize C2. C2. We take, we take um, the line segment that starts at 0, 0, 1, at, that starts at 0, 0, 0, and goes to 0, 0, 1. So plus t times 0, 0, 1 minus 0, 0, 0. Again, this simplifies greatly to r of t equals just 0, 0, t for t between 0 and 1. So what's the integral along c2? All right. This time, let's be smarter. <laughs> we get our vector field evaluated at R of t. So we'll put that here. This is our vector field evaluated at R of t. And you dot with R prime of t. Well, R prime of t is 0, 0, 1 dt. So the only component we care about in f of R of t, because the 0 there and the 0 there, is this third component. So we might as well only put that one in. This one, when you put in x is 0, y is 0, and z is t, you get 0, 0, you get 1 over 1 plus t squared. And so you, you calculate this as t goes from 0 to 1, and you have to integrate from 0 to 1, 1 over 1 plus t squared dt. Oh, that's the arc, the inverse tangent. Evaluated from 0 to 1, you get the inverse tan of 1, which is pi over 4, minus the inverse tangent of 0. That's pi over 4. So that's our line integral along C2. It's pi over 4. And so our line integral along C1 plus C2 is the sum of those two which means it's 1 minus e plus pi over 4. That's our line integral along c1 plus c2. Now we need to do the line integral along c3. And I have erased my picture, so let me 
draw again what we're doing. Here's one zero zero. Here's zero zero one. C1 went here, C2 went here, C3 was this quarter of a circle right here, oriented so that you start at 1, 0, 0, and you go to 0, 0, 1, just like C1 plus C2. So if you actually draw that in the xz plane, so here's x, here's z, it starts I'm ignoring the y coordinate, it starts at 1, 0 and goes to 0, 1, which means we're parameterizing and we're parameterizing this way. So counterclockwise, like we like to parameterize circles. And so our parameterization that we pick, yeah, the y coordinate's actually 0, I'll put all three coordinates back, but the x coordinate is just cosine of t. The y coordinate, you're always in where y is 0, is this. And the z-coordinate is sine of t, and this is for 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to pi over 2 now. And my claim is that the line integral along C3 comes out to be the same thing that we got here. All right, let's check it. So our parameterization now. So this is... C3, r of t equals cosine of t, 0, sine of t. t is between 0 and pi over 2. Will we get the same thing? Well, we better. So, the line integral along C3, f dot dr, the integral is t goes from 0 to pi over 2. All right, we'll put this in for x, this in for y, this in for z. So since we're putting in 0 for y, this part goes away. The e to the x is e to the cosine of t. xz, um, x times z, is sine of t times cosine of, well, cosine of t times the sine of t, plus the cosine of y, which is 1, cosine of 0 is 1, comma, x times y, all right, that part's 0, but then plus 1 over 1 plus sine squared t. And then you dot this with r prime of t, so we dot with minus the sine of t, 0, the cosine of t, and then you multiply by dt and you integrate. Well, the middle part gets wiped out. And we have to integrate from 0 to pi over 2 um, minus, so e to the cosine of t times minus the sine of t dt. And I'll go ahead and split this off plus, well, actually let me not split it off yet, plus 0 plus 1 over 1 plus sine squared t times cosine of t dt. Now this looks awful, but it's not. Oh, times cosine of, t. yeah, this is right. Let me. So this looks awful, but it's actually not. If you split up these two integrals, this one and this one, and make the substitution, u equals cosine of t here, and the substitution u equals sine of t here, then this part, when you make substitution u equals cosine of t, d u will be exactly minus sine of t dt. If you make substitution u is sine of t, d u will be exactly the cosine of t dt. So what you find that you end up with is you get e to the cosine of t plus the inverse tangent of sine of t evaluated, yeah, it's not going to fit there. Let me write it on the next line. You get e to the cosine of t plus the inverse tangent of sine of t evaluated as t goes from 0 to pi over 2. 
All right, you plug in pi over 2 for t. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so you get e to the 0, so that's 1. Plus the sine of pi over 2, that's 1, inverse tangent of 1, pi over 4. Minus what you get at 0. At 0, you get e to the cosine of 0. That is e to the 1, so minus e to the 1, minus the inverse tangent of the sine of 0. That's the inverse tan of 0. That's 0. So we get 1 plus pi over 4 minus e. Oh, that's what we got before. 1 plus pi over 4 minus e, or 1 minus e plus pi over 4. As promised, we got the same line integral along C3 that we got along C1 plus C2. Um, this vector field is very special, and we'll talk about it in the next section. It's conservative, and as long as you start and end at the same point, it doesn't matter what path you pick between them, you'll get the same line integral. That is a very special property of vector fields. We'll look at it next time.